Okay, so we're going to start our last section of notes for our first big test, which is on limits at infinity. Now, what we had seen prior to this in section 2.5 is where we were discussing what we call infinite limits. And infinite limits, if you will recall, are those limits where you have x approaching a specific finite value, and those limits will either grow without bound to infinity or decrease without bound to negative infinity. So that's what we saw back in section 2.5. What we're going to be talking about today is looking at limits as x grows infinitely large. In other words, we're going to be looking at as x goes to infinity. Oops, it would be helpful if I actually put an x in there. As x goes to infinity or as x goes to negative infinity. So x is not going toward a specific finite value, but it's going toward plus or minus infinity. Which is basically, if you recall from your pre-calculus uh, last year, is where we're looking at basically the end behavior of the graph. As x goes to infinity would be our right end, and as x goes to negative infinity, that would be our left end of the graph. So we basically want to figure out what's happening to the function as x goes to plus or minus infinity. And just as a kind of a one caveat about these types of what we call limits at infinity, limits at infinity, they must be one-sided by their very nature because you can't really approach infinity from above infinity, okay? You have to think about it in terms of like you're starting at the origin, you're moving from the origin to the right, heading toward infinity, or moving toward the left, toward negative infinity. So these are always kind of think of those as one-sided limits, even though we're not using the notation we did before with the plus and the minus, these are going to be one-sided limits. Right. And the other thing that you want to kind of make sure when you are kind of thinking about this idea of end behavior, not all functions have both end behaviors, and some don't even have any at all. They have to actually make it to negative infinity and infinity. Like for example here, our function f of x equals the square root of x, is undefined for all negative values. So that doesn't actually have a left end because x cannot approach negative infinity. If you recall your square root graph when we sketch it out, it doesn't start until x equals 0 and then kind of goes out in this direction. So there is no left end. So and if they have no left end, then the limit would not exist. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the square root of x, we would say does not exist because it doesn't have a left end. All right, now basically there are only a few things that can happen when we're looking at our end behavior. Either the ends of the graph can increase without bound, which is basically head to infinity, so f of x approaches infinity. They both, the ends will go up. The ends can go down, which means f of x would approach negative infinity. Uh, the third type would be the ends of the graph oscillate between two fixed values. For example, your sine and your cosine. They will oscillate between negative 1 and 1 and they forever. Just continually go back and forth between 1 and negative 1 every period. And so this is the oscillation between two fixed values. Now these first three, if you will recall, because their limits do not exist, and this one where it oscillates is going to be a D and E situation, that in all three of these cases, because these are not numbers and this one just simply doesn't exist, these are limits that don't exist. But just like what we saw with our one-sided limits, because infinite limits or limits at infinity that are infinite, which is what this is basically talking about, these first two, um, because they're one-sided, we do still want to answer the question and say infinity or negative infinity if possible. And we only say D and E if we, if we can't choose that it increases or decreases without bound. All right, and then the fourth case, and that's kind of going to be the one that's going to be the most important that we're going to be looking at. And that's where a graph will taper off toward a specific finite value. So you're basically thinking of this as kind of like a horizontal asymptote. The graph, as you go to the left end or to the right end, is going to approach some horizontal line or some specific y value that it is headed toward. All right, so those are the only options that you have. And so basically, taking a look at this, 
Then let's look at example one. Now what I'd like you to do here is I'd like you to think about your list of parent functions from Algebra 2 and Precalculus. And I want you to come up with an, a parent function that would exhibit each of these four different end behaviors. And we're specifically going to be looking at the left end just in this example. So what I want you to do is I want you to give me the parent graph, show me a sketch, and then give me the left end behavior using the correct limit notation. So I want you to pause the video and we'll come back together at the end, but choose a parent graph from either Algebra 2 or Precalculus, Trigonometry, and use that to illustrate the behavior that's listed and then write it in limit notation. So pause the video and we'll come back together in a moment. Okay, so here we're looking at what uh, an example, kind of what I consider the most obvious example for a left end that can increase without bound. Um, most common parent graph, y equals x squared, your square function. Actually, both the left and the right end go up, but the left end is increasing without bound. The y values are going to infinity or up. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity, the left end of x squared equals infinity because it goes up. Now I do have written here kind of the or does not exist because technically it doesn't exist. However, we do want you to go ahead and write down the plus or minus infinity that it would work with. Okay, the function that I chose for the left end over here in this behavior, where I want the left end to decrease without bound, I chose just a nice cubic. Any odd power function would do here. Uh, you might have picked something a little different. Um, but the left end is decreasing without bound because the left end is going down here to negative infinity. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity of x cubed is equal to negative infinity. Okay, and then our last, well not our last, our third one here, we just needed an oscillating function. You may have chosen a cosine. Actually pretty much any one of the trig functions would have worked here because they would not settle down to any one specific value. Even the cosecant graphs, because they have the, even though they have the vertical asymptotes, they keep continually jumping from positive values to negative values to positive values and so on. So because it has this oscillating nature, it would be does not exist. So here's your limit notation for an example of this. And then our last example, a graph that has a horizontal asymptote. Now I picked the graph of f of x equal to 1 over x because it has a nice end behavior where both the left and the right end are approaching a horizontal asymptote of zero. So that gives us kind of our little snapshot of some of the basic parent graphs that exhibit the four types of behavior that we're talking about. Now what I'd like you to do is take a moment and pause, and I want you to come up with, there is, uh, just because we need to review some trig as well, there are, or there is, an inverse trig function that has a horizontal asymptote, actually has two of them. So what I'd like you to do is take a moment, review your inverse trig functions, inverse sine, cosine, tangent, and so on, and make a list and choose one that has a horizontal asymptote and give me the left end behavior of it. Um, I'd like you to do the sketch, show me the end behavior, and give me the limit notation for it as well. So pause the video and go review your inverse trig functions. All right, coming back together then, let's take a look at uh, what we have down here. Here is our inverse trig function, inverse tangent. And if you'll recall with inverse tangent, it has the horizontal asymptotes at y equals negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And it increases coming around through here. Remember, it's your originally your tangent function, one period of your tangent function flipped over the line y equals x. And so the limit, the left end of this function, is approaching this horizontal line, y equals negative pi over 2. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity of inverse tangent of x is negative pi over 2. So that kind of gives you a good overview of a few functions that we're going to be looking at. But now the most important kind of limit, infinite, or limit at infinity that we want to talk about is the case where you end up with an actual value. Because what that does is that tells us something very important about the graph of the function, which is that it has a horizontal asymptote. So if you'll recall, when we look at our four options for what might be happening for a limit at infinity, the first three do not exist. Your oscillating and then your unbounded ones. 
But number four, this is the one that's going to give us the actual information about what's really going on and the fact that you have a horizontal asymptote on your graph. It gives us a lot of good information about a function that we're going to be looking at. So in general, let's write down our basic definition of what a horizontal asymptote is. And so that way, every time we, in terms of limits, I mean, now we kind of know from our own visual and graphical representation what a horizontal asymptote is. But we're basically going to say the line y equal to l, and l is going to be a real number, so where l is some real number. And that line, that horizontal line, is a horizontal asymptote. if the following is true. And, and really, it's really if either of the following is true. So number one, the first thing that we're going to look at is the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. The left-hand behavior of f of x has to equal that constant l or the limit as x approaches negative infinity to the left end of f of x. Actually, I already did the left end, so let's do the right end here. As x approaches infinity of f of x has to be L as well. Now, notice I didn't say that they both have to approach the same constant in order for there to be a horizontal asymptote. And hopefully that will kind of give you kind of a caveat here that there are either 0, 1, or 2 horizontal asymptotes in a function. That's because you basically you have two ends. So you could have no horizontal asymptotes. The end behavior of the graph is either unbounded or oscillates. You could have one horizontal asymptote where maybe one end is unbounded, the other end approaches the horizontal asymptote, or they both approach the same one. Or you could have two with the left and the right approach different horizontal asymptotes. And we did see the case down here in my examples in your inverse tangent. You have two horizontal asymptotes because the left end is going to negative pi over 2, but the right end is going to pi over 2. So that shows you a case of where you have two when you're looking at it. All right, and then coming down here, and this is a little recap from section 2.5. All the properties that we had from infinite limits in section 2.5 are going to apply for limits at infinity as well. Uh, that they kind of follow the same rules. The only difference between them is wherever in the limits properties in 2.5 we had x approaches c, you would approach, you would replace it with x approaches negative infinity or x approaches infinity. So for example here, remember that when you have and you want to make sure that one limit exists. This one is approaching zero. So it's going to be becoming an increasingly small number. The closer and closer and closer you get to plus or minus infinity. This one is approaching a constant of some sort. So we have two limits at infinity, both of which exist and have values. One's a constant and one's zero. And if the one that happens to have a limit of zero is in the denominator, that means that you have a constant divided by that increasingly small number. And what's going to happen here is this is going to either grow or decrease without bound, depending on the sign of L and the sign of this increasingly small number, which you would find from looking at whether you're approaching 0 from the left or from the right. So that's very similar to what we did in the last section. We also have those properties. And again, these properties are contingent upon the fact that one of the limits exists and is a constant, and the other limit is going to be an infinite limit. So we have, just kind of illustrate that you get confused with these both of these different types of limits at infinity and infinite limits. This is a limit at infinity because x is going to plus or minus infinity, but it's called an infinite limit because it equals infinity. So this is a limit at infinity that is an infinite limit. This is a limit at infinity that is a constant that exists. And so the rules that we had before, which the key is that at least one of them actually exists and is a constant, that if you want to take the limit of a sum or difference, 
you can basically think of this as the sum of the limits and you end up with essentially in this problem your infinity plus or minus some constant L. And infinity plus a number is still infinity and infinity minus a number is still infinity no matter how big this number is because remember infinity is so much bigger than everything else that it doesn't really make any difference. So this is what we consider to be negligible in terms of the limit and it would equal infinity. When we do the product that we're looking at here, uh, when you do the limit of a product, you can do the product of the limits as long as one of them exists. The limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of f of x was defined to be infinity times g of x is going to be l. And as long as l is a positive number, a positive number times infinity is still going to give us infinity as our final result. And then down here, same thing, it's still infinity times L, but when L is negative, a negative times infinity makes it negative infinity. So these are kind of, you know, should be a little bit of the common sense, a little bit of straightforward ideas of how these properties work with the limits at infinity as well as the infinite limit that's involved in it. Again, remember the caveat is at least one of these has to exist. Uh, we'll talk about what happens when they both don't exist. Okay, and our last little situation down here, when we have the limit of a quotient, as long as one of them exists, we're going to be able to look at the limit of the top, which is your constant, over the limit of your bottom, which is going to infinity. So we have a fixed number over infinity, and then whenever you get that case, that's going to be going to zero. Okay, so that's kind of a recap very similar to what we did back in section 2.5. Now, based on the third property that I just listed, there are going to be two facts that are going to be something that we use quite a bit in finding more complicated limits at infinity. And let me remind you what that third fact was, which is that whenever you get a constant over infinity, that you're going to end up with a limit at zero. So taking a look at these two, basically this is what we're talking about. This one says you've got a rational, positive rational number, which basically means that you've got a power function here where you have like x squared, x cubed, but you could have x to the one half, x to the one third. You can basically have any nice power function that you have here, as long as it's a positive exponent. And that when I'm looking at this, you're going to always, as x goes to infinity or negative infinity, the bottom is either going to grow or increase with that brown. So I'm always going to be in that case where I have c over infinity or the constant over negative infinity. And in both of those cases, it doesn't really matter, both of those are going to approach zero. So that's the first fact that we're going to use. And then the second fact is really looking at the left side. I'm looking at the left end behavior. And the only qualification they put here is that the power function has to be defined for x less than zero. The reason that we do this is because if I was going to do the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 1 over x to the 1 half, this would be does not exist because there's no left end because it's not defined for negative values. So we just put in that additional caveat that it, it's equal to zero for the as x approaches negative infinity as long as this power function is defined for negative numbers and actually gets to negative infinity. Alright, so let's take a look at how we're going to use this. And specifically we're going to look at, these are a couple of polynomials. Now, initially when you look at this, you might say, hey, I can do what we did before, which is I can go ahead and just take the limit of a sum or difference is the sum or difference of the limits and just split it up. But when you look at this and we say, well, what's the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x to the fourth? Well, this is an even power function with a positive lead coefficient, so both ends go up. So the right end is going up to infinity. And then you have your x squared, whose right end is going to infinity, but I'm subtracting it. So I have minus infinity. And then I have 8x. As x goes to infinity, the right end goes up. Uh, but I'm subtracting it, so I would have minus infinity. But then the question becomes, what do I do with this? The problem that you have here, and it's really this part of it that's going to be the problem, this is another example of what we call an indeterminate form. And the idea is, and we studied this in Algebra 2, and you might want to make a note to yourself, 
there are actually different sizes of infinity. And this is, you know, something that might blow your mind just a little bit, but not all infinities are the same. So when I'm looking at this difference here, this infinity minus infinity, you would be tempted to say, well, that's going to be equal to zero. But the problem comes in is that this infinity and this infinity may or may not be the same. One might be twice as big as the other one. Uh, this one might be the larger one, so that if I subtract, it would actually go to negative infinity. So this is called indeterminate, because I don't really know whether this infinity is bigger, which would make this go to infinity. Could be that this infinity is bigger, which would make this go to negative infinity. Or they could be the same size, and you could actually get zero. So that's why it's called indeterminate. Notice that if I had gotten infinity plus infinity, this is not indeterminate. We know that this is going to be infinity. Big number plus a really big number is always going to be a really, really big number. So that doesn't bother me at all. This is not indeterminate. It is only where you have the subtraction that's going to cause it to be indeterminate. So we need another method for how we're going to do this. And I'm actually going to show you two methods. Uh, one's a little bit longer, kind of the explanation of why the shortcut method is going to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of scan through my polynomial and I'm going to look for the dominating function. Okay, We have uh, the term that's going to tell me what the degree is, which in polynomials, if you rem remember, your dominant function is going to be the one with the highest power, which tells you the degree, which is the 2x to the fourth term. So when I see that, what I'm going to do, and this is kind of the algebra technique that we would use for these, is I am going to factor out the power function with the highest degree. So it's going to become x to the fourth times, and then you write down what you have left, your 2 minus, and remember factoring out x to the fourth is the same as taking each of these and dividing by x to the fourth. So if I divide x squared by x to the fourth, I would get 1 over x squared. If I divide 8x by x to the fourth, I would get 8 over x now, you might be wondering, well, why does this help me in determining this limit? Well, when I take a look at this limit, now I have the limit of a product, which I can split into the product of the limits as long as at least one of them exists. Now, the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the fourth is an infinite limit, so that one doesn't exist. However, let's look at this second part right here. So I'm going to go ahead and split it. You'll just have to have faith on that the second one is actually going to work and be a limit that exists. But I want to look at that individually. I want to do the limit as x goes to infinity, 2 minus 1 over x squared minus 8 over x cubed. Here I have the limit of a sum or an difference. And the limit as x goes to infinity of 2, limit of a constant is a constant. It doesn't matter that that's not going to a number. It's still fine. When you go to limits add infinity, we follow the same rules as before. And then here are those two special cases that we just listed up here. Whenever I have a constant over a power function, the limit, as long as it exists, is going to go to zero. And I'm doing a write-in limit, so I don't have to worry about checking about the existence part. So we end up with minus zero minus zero. So this limit right here essentially evaluates to two. And a lot of times you'll start to see me, instead of writing this step down, I kind of go, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and then I'll write down two as my final answer. And then here, the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the fourth, well, that's an infinite limit. The right end of x to the fourth goes up, so it's infinity. And then what's twice infinity? It's still going to be infinity, which is my final answer. Okay. But there is a, there's a shortcut for this. And the shortcut is really based on the fact that the items, the, de the terms in the polynomial that have a smaller degree, we're going to classify this as the stuff that doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter to the idea of taking the limit. So if this is the stuff that doesn't matter in the limit, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to say that this limit as x approaches infinity of this polynomial, 2x to the fourth, minus x squared, minus 8x, 
since this stuff doesn't matter, you only have to look at the dominant function. So I'm going to take the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x to the fourth. So I'm only going to look at the dominant function. And the limit of a scalar multiple times a function, you can pull that to the front, and the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the fourth is infinity, which is our infinity answer that we had gotten before. But this is our shortcut for the problem. Okay. Likewise, if I were to look down at this one, and again, this, the idea is the same. What we can do is we can go through the long process, which is factor out the t to the fifth. I'll just write it right below it right here. Limit as t goes to negative infinity. Notice I'm doing the left end this time. I still factor out the highest power. One third plus two over t squared minus one over t cubed plus eight over t to the fifth. That when you're looking at this limit, what you see is I have a limit of a product, and the limit of this piece of the product will exist because each of these terms don't matter, and they will go to zero. So what I have left is one-third times t to the fifth. So I can take this into the limit as t goes to negative infinity of i one-third t to the fifth. Right there is my shortcut that's left. And that would be scalar multiple times as the left end of t to the fifth, odd power function is going down, so that would be negative infinity, and a constant times negative infinity is still negative infinity. All right, so that in general gives us kind of our little summary here for our limits of polynomials. So if p of x is a polynomial, and if you will remind yourself what does a polynomial look like? P of x, little notation. A sub n, x to the n, would be the highest degree. Remember, this is just a way of notating the coefficient of the nth degree term. Plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus dot, dot, dot. Kind of spilling over here, but we'll fit it in. Uh, a sub 2, x squared. Uh, let me just come down here below, plus a sub 1x plus, to the first, even though you don't write it, a sub 0, our constant term. So in the polynomial, here is our dominant function, the one with the highest degree. Here's your constant term. And then this, of course, is your lead coefficient, just to give you all the parts of your polynomial. So if I have a polynomial in this form, then I want to find the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of this polynomial. I can ignore all the stuff that doesn't matter and only look at the dominant function and take the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of a sub n x to the n. And so that gives us our little shortcut for our polynomial. Now, before we move on to rational functions, I do want to talk about this indeterminate form just a little bit more. We've seen indeterminate forms uh, back when we were doing our just basic limits as x approaches c when we got the 0 over 0. Now, the reason that this is called an indeterminate form is that there are basically several rules that you want to try to use to evaluate this, and they are contradictory to each other. Like for example, you could say, well, anything divided by itself is 1. So you might want to say 0 over 0 is 1. But then you have a rule that says 0 divided by something is going to be 0. All right, so right there, that contradicts the conclusion I got using the other rule. And then there's a third rule that says anything divided by 0 is undefined. So you basically have three options to evaluate this. So you end up with 1 your zero or undefined. And basically, and it doesn't even have to be any of those three at the end, when you see something like this, this is code for I have to do more work. And I gave you a lot of algebraic techniques 
for how to calculate a limit when you see 0 over 0. All right, a couple more indeterminate forms that we've seen here, the one that we just saw, infinity minus infinity, because we're not sure which one is larger. This could be 0, this one could be bigger, that one could be bigger. So it could actually end up being 0 plus or minus infinity in the end. There's three competing ideas here. And then the next kind of indeterminate form is going to be any time you get infinity over infinity. And it's the same reason why this one is indeterminate. There are different sizes of infinity. If the top infinity is larger than the bottom infinity, it's possible that it can go to infinity. If the bottom is larger than the top, then it's possible that it can go to zero. And if there's some relationship that maybe the top is exactly twice as big as the bottom, then this could equal two. Or it could equal one if they were the same size. So that's why these are called indeterminate forms code for you is really saying you have to do a little bit more work in algebra in order to determine what the limit is going to be. Alright, so let's take a look at my rational function right here. So we have a rational function that's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. And your first gut check is going to be to say, hey, why don't I just split this up? The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits and take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom. So you might come along and say, well, let's go ahead and let's try that. So I do the limit as x goes to, uh, I believe that in this problem we're doing negative infinity. So negative infinity of 3x squared minus 8x plus 12 divided by the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the denominator, 5x cubed plus 4x squared minus x minus 2. And then we say, well, these are nothing more than polynomials, so I can then go ahead and only look at the dominant functions. So we have the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 3x squared over the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x cubed. Now here's where the problem really starts to come into play and why we can't split up a rational function like this. The limit of the top, the left end of 3x squared is going to go up, the left end of 5x cubed is going down. And right there, I get an indeterminate form. So that tells me, and this is going to be true of pretty much every polynomial, you can't really separate out a rational function into the separate components and then take the limit. That's not going to work because of this indeterminate form. What we're going to do is we're going to employ kind of the same idea that we did as the shortcut for polynomials. We're going to look at this and we're going to say the dominant function of a rational function is going to be the ratio of the dominant functions of the numerator and denominator. So I can reduce this to the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 3x squared over 5x cubed. Once I get it to here, I still can't split it because it would be indeterminate, but I can simplify. There's the algebra that's going to manipulate this. If I cancel the common terms, I end up with 3 over 5x. Now once I get to here, notice that now if I were to try to split the limit into the top and the bottom, the limit of the top exists. We would have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 3, which is a constant, over the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 5x. And that's something that we can do because one of the limits exists. This ends up, limit of a constant is a constant. And then the limit on the bottom, 5x, has left in behavior of negative infinity. And then that goes into one of our rules that we had before. A fixed number divided by negative infinity is going to give us a limit of 0. So we can very quickly calculate it by looking at this ratio of dominant terms. All right, let's take a look at the second example. Same idea, I'm going to do the shortcut now. I'm not even going to worry about the long one. Here's my ratio of dominant functions. Take the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x to the fourth over negative 5x to the fourth. I simplify, we have a common factor, limit as x goes to infinity of essentially negative 2 fifths is what we're going to have left because the x to the fourths are going to cancel. And the limit of a constant is 
the constant. So in this case, and this is going to be, if you were actually calculating this limit like I did up here, you would still get the limit of the top is infinity. The limit of the bottom is negative infinity. I get exactly the same indeterminate form I got in the previous example, but I got a completely different answer. And that's kind of the moral of indeterminate forms. You have to do a little extra work down here in order to figure out what's going to happen in that situation. All right, and then our third example down here, same thing. Let's take the limit as x goes to infinity. Now, in my examples, I did put the dominant functions kind of at the beginning and then went in decreasing order. They're not always going to be there. So make sure you're picking the highest degree uh, term when you're doing this. So it would be the 2x to the fourth over my 3x squared, which would give me the limit as x goes to infinity. And then canceling out here, we would end up with a 2x squared over 3. Now, I can take the limit, I can split it because the bottom exists. When I do that, the limit of the top, the right end of 2x squared is going up. The limit of a constant is the constant. And what happens when you have infinity divided by a positive number? You get infinity. So that gives us kind of our little review of how we're going to deal with our rational functions. Now notice that I kind of have three situations in here, and I, I specifically picked these three examples. I had one that gave me a limit of zero, one that gave me a limit that was a different constant than zero, and then I had a third one that was unbounded and gave me an infinite limit. And the important thing about these is remember that when the limit equals a number, a constant, what we know about the graph is that there is a horizontal asymptote in this first case, at y equal to 0. And in this second case, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 2 fifths. And then in this third case, there is no horizontal asymptote because the end behavior is unbounded when we're looking at it. So that kind of gives you our three cases that we're looking at. Now I'm going to give you kind of another way of looking at this and talk about this limits of rational functions. In the first case, what you should notice is that take a look at your dominant functions and look at their degree. I have a degree of 2 in the top and a degree of 3 in the bottom. The degree on the bottom is larger, and that's case 1. The degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator. And so this is going to help save you some time because you're basically going to look at a rational function and say, hey, the degree of the denominator is larger. So the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of that rational function, I'm going to call it r of x, is always, always going to be 0, and there's going to be a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. All right, our second case, we look back at the second example that we just did. In that one, the degree on the top and the degree on the bottom are the same, and of course they would cancel out which gave me the limit of a constant, which gave me that constant. Now notice where these numbers are coming from. This 2, that is the lead coefficient of the polynomial in the top, and the negative 5 is the lead coefficient of the polynomial in the bottom. So if the degree of the denominator is exactly equal to the degree of the numerator, then I don't need to actually do a lot of work for that one either. The limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of that rational function r of x is simply going to be the lead coefficient of my numerator divided by the lead coefficient of the denominator. And that would be my horizontal asymptote. Suppose that this was... Um, a sub n and b sub n, just to give them different names, then you would have y equals that ratio of lead coefficients as your horizontal asymptote. And then we look at our third case. Now we've done the degree of the denominator is larger, the degree is equal, and now we'll do the degree is less than. So when the degree of the denominator is less than 
the degree of the numerator. And then if I want to calculate this limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of r of x, now what's going to happen? Well, what will happen is because the degree in the denominator is smaller, all the x's in the denominator will cancel out. And you'll basically be left with trying to calculate the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of the dominant function on the top, and then I'm going to use p, over a constant on the bottom. Because you would cancel out, like if this had been a fifth degree and a third degree, you would end up with p equal to 2, because it would cancel out. So this is whatever you have left after you cancel out the common terms. Now, remember that this goes back into our basic rule. We have the limit of a function up here. And because it's a power function, it's going to either go to plus or minus infinity, depending upon whether this is even or odd, or what this power is, and whether the coefficient is even or odd, divided by a constant. And so you basically are going to just take a look at this and look at the sign of the numerator and look at the sign of the denominator and figure out whether the combination is going to be positive or negative. So the final answer will either be plus or minus infinity. You just have to figure it out based on the signs of your two parts of your fraction. Now one more comment. This right here, this case right here, this is where we get the no horizontal asymptotes. But what we do have is what we like to call the other asymptotes. And if you'll recall these from your pre-calculus, the other asymptotes are things like slant asymptotes. And you would get a slant asymptote, which is nothing more than a diagonal line, when p is 1. You could get what we call a quadratic asymptote, which would occur if p is 2. And if p is 3, you would have a cubic, and so on, and so on, and so on going up from that. And we call them the other asymptote because you end up with a power function. And we're not going to do it in this set of notes, but just as a review, how do I actually find the equation? You find the other asymptotes using long division. You actually take your denominator and divide it into your numerator. So if I had um, I don't have enough room to try to fit this in here. But if I had a rational function, and I had a numerator and a denominator, I would use that long division and divide q of x into p of x. Okay, and you'll just remember you kind of do your work going down through here. Uh, you end up with the quotient, which is what we call the item up here. And then you come down here, and at some point you'll end up with your remainder. So if you do that actual long division, the other asymptote is the quotient, whatever that equation ends up to be. And we know that if when we reduce, it's 1, it'll be a line, mx plus b of some sort. If it ends up with 2 when we reduce this, then this will be a quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c, and so on and so on. All right, now we're going to move up to a little bit more complicated situation. What do we do if the degrees of the numerator and the denominator are not as explicit? In other words, it's not a polynomial over a polynomial. Typically, we're going to be looking at when we have a radical. And the nice thing about this is we're still going to kind of do exactly the same thing. We still can't split this because in the top, the square root doesn't really affect anything because you kind of go underneath and say, this is going to negative infinity. 3x squared is going to end up going to infinity because its left end is going up. Adding 6 to infinity is still infinity and the square root of infinity is still infinity. And then in the bottom um, I do 5 minus 2 times negative infinity. You end up with another infinity on the bottom. And so this is going to actually end up being infinity over infinity. So it's an indeterminate. You can't split this up. But we can kind of do the same thing that we did before by looking at this idea of dominant functions. Even though the square root is there, the dominant function on the top is still going to be the 3x squared, but with the square root over it. Now the dominant function on the bottom is going to be this minus 2x. So I can simplify this 
and take a look at the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 3x squared over negative 2x. And basically at this point you're going to try to simplify this. Now where you're going to have to remember something here. Bring down my limit. I can split this because square root of 3 is positive, square root of x squared is positive. So as long as at least one of these items is positive, I can split the square root and distribute it over multiplication, not over addition. And then I'm over my negative 2x. Now here's where you need to put a big star and kind of think about this. Okay, let's recall from Algebra 2. The square root of x squared is not equal to x. Do you guys remember what that's equal to? That's equal to absolute value of x, which is a piecewise function. And remember your definition of absolute value, it would be x if x is greater than or equal to 0 and negative x if x is less than 0. And here's the trick about using piecewise functions when you're doing these limits at infinity. Notice that if I'm doing this limit at infinity, that x is going to negative infinity, this is the left end of the graph that we're looking at. So if I'm looking at the left end of the graph, that's where you have the negative numbers. So this is also talking about the left end of the graph. So if I want to know how to, what to replace this with, I mean, I could replace it with absolute value, but that doesn't help me calculate the limit. I really want to pick the piece that matches where I'm trying to do the limit. So I'm going to pick the left end, which is the negative x, and that's what I'm going to plug in. So this is going to become the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 3 times negative x over negative 2x. That's going to allow me to simplify this fraction so that I can actually take the limit and not have an indeterminate form of infinity over infinity. So now I plug in my, or cancel my common terms. So I end up with the limit as x goes to negative infinity of, the x's are going to cancel, the negatives are going to cancel. The only thing I'm left with is square root of 3 over 2. Limit of a constant is the constant, and there's my final answer to this problem. Now notice the only difference, take a look at the next section, which I wish I could have gotten these on the same page. This is going to go to exactly the same first steps, even though I'm doing the right end now. It's still going to split to its dominant functions. I'm still going to split my radical, distribute it across the multiplication, square root of 3, square root of x squared. But what's different now is now I'm doing the right end. So if I look at my definition for absolute value over here, this is the left end. This is the right end. So if I'm doing the right end limit, this is what I'm going to replace it with. So I'm going to use the x instead of the negative x. So this becomes the limit as x goes to infinity of square root of 3 times x, because that's the right end of the piecewise function, over negative 2x. Cancel your common terms. I have the limit as x goes to infinity of negative square root of 3 over 2. Limit of a constant is the constant. And so that kind of gives you an idea that the only thing you have to worry about when you have the radical, you can still choose the dominant function. But you have to remember the square root of x squared is absolute value, which is a piecewise, and you have to pick the correct piece when you do the simplification. All right, let's look at this one last example. I'm going to do very similar to what I did before, but I picked this one for a reason. I'm going to do the limit as x goes to negative infinity, dominant function of the top, dominant function of the bottom, 9x cubed. But be very careful about this. Okay, first, if I wanted to think about what's going on here, as x goes to negative infinity here, this is going to be a negative number because I'm cubing it. And the square root of a negative number is going to be undefined. And so that is a, hey, wait a minute. Remember that the limit at infinity did not exist when there was 
a discontinuity, a regional discontinuity. This has a regional discontinuity. It can't have really small negative numbers because that's going to make this undefined. So this limit is actually does not exist, and you don't have to do a lot of the work that you did before. All right, now before we finish out this first part of these limits at infinity nodes, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of the dominant function and this idea of what we call who wins the race. And when I say wins the race, I'm talking about winning the race to infinity. And the idea is, is that different functions grow at different rates. Some will be faster, some will be slower. Specifically for the functions that you've studied up until now, your log functions are going to grow very slowly. Your polynomials are going to be faster than the log functions, and they're also faster by order of degree. So an x squared is going to be faster than x to the first, and x to the first is going to be faster than x to the one half. We can have the rational exponents in there. Um, and we can have x to the tenth is going to be faster than any of the other ones that I just listed. The next list, the one that grows faster than the polynomials, is going to be exponential growth. Remember, growth is when you have the base of your exponential function greater than 1. And then after that, we're going to include our factorials. Remember, factorial is where you take repeated multiplication, you decrease by 1. So if you have a function like x factorial, that's going to be a faster growth than exponential or polynomial. And then the king of growth is x to the x power. That's going to grow the fastest of all of these different lists of values that you have. And so that if you have a ratio of these types of functions, we don't actually, we can't simplify. Like, look down here at this problem. I can't, there's nothing to cancel. There's nothing to simplify. And I'm doing the limit as x goes to infinity. The limit of the top is infinity. The limit of the bottom is infinity. So you're like, I got an indeterminate form. And you're like, well, what do I do? Well, this is where we're just going to go, well, who wins the race? When we look at this, I'm going to know that of these two choices, the exponential function in the bottom wins the race to infinity. It goes faster. This one is going to be what we call the slow one, the slow infinity. And when you're looking at this in terms of trying to calculate a limit, you can treat the slow infinity, it will act like a constant. Because it's going slower than the other one. And so if I were to evaluate this, what I'm basically looking at then is we're going to have a, come this way, constant, because the top's going to act like a constant, over infinity, and do you remember what the rule is? If I have a constant divided by infinity, that's going to give me a limit of zero. And so the idea is you don't even have to simplify. A lot of times you can just think about who's winning the race, and then you can figure out what's going on. And anytime the bottom wins the race, it's going to be zero. All right, so let's take a look over here at this one, part C. This is a very similar example. We have a log function and an x squared function. As x goes to infinity, they both grow without bounds. But if you look at my list up here of which one grows faster, polynomials grow faster than logs. So the slow one, again, is on the top. So it will act like a constant, and so that one would be 0. So that's kind of one of the key things that you're looking for. Now here, let's take a look at this. The limit of the top is a constant. So we already have that part taken care of. Now the limit of the bottom, don't let this bother you. Right now, initially, if you were just kind of doing the idea of direct substitution, 5x, the right side, goes to infinity, and cosine of x squared, as you go to infinity, it oscillates. So remember, we kind of think of this as minus does not exist. And you would be tempted at this point to say, hey, this limit doesn't exist. But you don't want to do that. You want to look at why it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because this is going to oscillate between negative 1 and negative 1, or negative 1 and positive 1. Now let's think about this. What's infinity minus negative 1? It's still infinity, right? What's infinity plus negative 1 or minus 1? That's still infinity. Even though this did not exist, that's not going to cause the limit to not exist. You basically are going to say, well, this is negligible. This trig function is not dominant at all because it's only oscillating between 1 and negative 1. 
this is the function that dominates. So this is going to essentially break down to c over infinity, and it's going to be equal to 0 as well. Okay, I'm going to look at one more over here in this one. In f, we want to see what happens in this case. Um, I'm going to leave these for you to do on your own. We'll talk with them in class next time, see if you have any questions. But let's talk specifically about this one. So I want to take a look at the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the x over x factorial. So just like before, they're both going to infinity, but the one that's going slower is going to be the one on the bottom. And let's think about what that means in terms of the limit. All right, so in this situation, the one that wins the race is the one on the top. And it's going to infinity so much faster than what's on the bottom, this again is going to act like a constant. So this is going to kind of have the behavior of infinity divided by a constant. Well, what's infinity divided by a constant? Well, that's just going to be infinity, as long as c is positive, and a factorial is always positive. Uh, it's going to infinity, so this is a positive constant. If it had been a negative constant, then it would have changed the sign. But that kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking at with these kind of using the who wins the race method of calculating some of these limits, which really only works when you have a nice ratio that you're looking at. All right, let's take a look at the next page. So I want you to kind of think, now they're going to get a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to let you try some of these on your own. Um, with the first two, you very specifically can look at the dominant functions, and those are very similar to something that I've already done. I'm going to put a little star by this one. I want you to give it a try, and I'm going to give you a hint on working through this one. This is going to use not only the idea of a dominant function, but I need to get this into a fraction. And so I'm going to kind of put a divide by 1 here. And then I'm going to remember a technique, an algebraic technique, that if you have a binomial with a radical in it, and you have trouble taking the limit, like I really can't plug in infinity and kind of do this directly, because you're going to end up with infinity, or I'm going to negative infinity here. So I would have negative infinity. And then when I put negative infinity in over here, this is going to end up being positive because it's a subtraction. And this one's positive. And so this would end up going to positive infinity. So I do have an indeterminate form. And the question is, well, what do I do? Do you remember the strategy to use when you had a binomial with a radical term? So I'm going to leave that as your hint to go back and look at previous sections and say, well, what did I do when I had a binomial with a radical? There was a technique, an algebraic technique that we used on that. Okay, so I'm going to leave you to try that one on your own. We'll discuss it in class next time. Over here, I'm going to give you this hint as well. When I try to do, I'm going to negative infinity again here, I'm going to get infinity over negative infinity, uh, but you can do the winning the race idea, so it's going to go to uh, negative infinity minus negative infinity. You have an indeterminate form. What would be really nice is instead of looking at this as two fractions where I have a subtraction, is maybe my hint to you might be to combine this into a single fraction and then take a look at it. And these I'm just going to let you examine and think about, well, what happens, because you'll notice right here we have a does not exist. Don't think about this as the limit doesn't exist for the sign. Think about what it's oscillating between and the effect of multiplying that times x or dividing it by x and see what you think about that. I also want you to go back and anytime you come up with a limit that did exist, so if the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of f of x was equal to L, then you know that you had a horizontal asymptote of y equal to L. So I just want you to go back and anytime we get this situation where the limit actually does exist and it's not an infinite limit or does not exist, then you can tell me what the horizontal asymptote is. And I'll go ahead and do it for the ones that we've calculated down here at the bottom. All three of these that I initially had would have horizontal asymptotes. of y equal to 0. 
Okay, so I'm going to leave you to come back and do D, E, and then also complete G through L, and bring that to class next time, and we will discuss it.